Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on us. Shine on us. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Please, Spirit, please set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Set we gaze on your kingly brightness so our faces display your likeness ever changing from glory to glory mirrored here may our lives tell your story shine on us shine on us shine Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Community. My name is Jim Lee, and we're glad you're able to join us for worship today. Uh, we especially want to welcome all those that are joining us online. Uh, let's turn around and wave at them. Hey. Especially some of those folks may not, may be a little under the weather, so we want to be sure to, to recognize them. Speaking of weather, a little chilly out there this morning. I've heard some comments already. It's easy to forget where we used to live, isn't it? <clears throat> I have one memory that sticks with me. Uh, I was in eastern Iowa, and I went to a hotel room about 6 p.m., turned on the evening news from the Quad Cities. It was about April 1, early, early April, and the headline story showed this line of people from the counter, out the door, lined up down the street at Whitey's Ice Cream, because it was 48 degrees and spring is here. <laughs> so today, as you leave after church, it's supposed to be about 48, 49 degrees, so just greet Pastor Chris with spring is here. I know he'll appreciate it. If you're new to Grace Community, we hope you remember to pick up a little gift bag on your way out and fill out one of these little keeping in touch cards just so that we know you were here today and put it in the offering basket on your way out and yes you do need to use your real name <laughs> uh, game day is back i go to game day my wife goes to game day we have a good time at game day you ought to come out and join us it's every other wednesday i believe as or is it every week now every other. every other week okay so it's this wednesday though uh bring your favorite game and a snack uh, it's a great way to get to know people. Uh, guys are welcome. Uh, don't expect to win. <laughs> right, Steve? I mean, we get torn up. But anyway, it's a, it's a fun time. Uh, one other thing here. Everyone is invited to join us. It's February 4th at 9 a.m. Uh, Pastor Cliff was telling me something about this uh, guest speaker. There's going to be a continental breakfast. A guest speaker named Dr. James Whitford of the True Charity uh, Initiative. I know if you're like me, you get constant things in the mail from everybody you ever gave five cents to, right? All the time. I think they spend more on the postage than you could possibly give them. But this is the, uh, someone who's speaking on the subject of real compassion, real results. Because you wonder sometimes, am I accomplishing anything? 
Uh, this is moving people from poverty and government dependence to a place of faith, flourishing, and personal responsibility. So you can sign up today in the uh, entryway, or as Pastor Cliff has renamed it, the Sheep Gate. That's right. All right. <laughs> That's what it is. It's the Sheep Gate. So let's take a moment, stand, greet one another in the love of the Lord. Let's uh, please remain standing and join me in our call to worship. We praise you, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that our souls, our nobler part, know very well. For no man knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him. You have made us of that rank of beings, which is a little lower than the heavenly beings, and is crowned with glory and honor. For it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. And the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. Our bodies are capable of being the temples of the Holy Spirit, and our souls of having the Spirit of God dwell in them. And therefore glorify you in our bodies and with our spirits, which are both yours. You, Lord, have formed us for yourself that we might declare your praise. Amen. I want to do a little experiment real quick. Can you do this with me? All right. Go ahead, Sherry. <laughs> for uh, making me feel better with all that clapping. I never know how to get you all clapping, so I figured, you know what, we'll just start with you. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue um, in the presence of the Lord as we're here together singing, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place.
touch of Jesus and you've never been the same, say amen. 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 And you may be seated.
Life lived one heartbeat at a time all around me. One fragile breath after another in a world sometimes hostile to it. Each soul created for the creator, honored, enjoyed, celebrated for his good pleasure. Often though, we forget we are all from the same dust, turning our backs on the need of our fellow humans. Brushed aside, neglected, forgotten, dismissed as too much to bear. Yet the one who made us bore it all for every one of our sakes, for those who are defenseless, for those who hold the most power. The Lord's decree to us has never changed. Protect life, nourish it, pour in all the grace you have, extend all the mercy you can, sacrifice as you must, reach long and hard for every hand. Whether it is a life, whether it carries a life, sanctity means that we give all the love back to the God who holds each soul in his hand by caring for his creation as long as we have breath. So we have baby, is that the thing I said? Or? So we have baby bottles out in the sheep gate. And feel free to take one and put your change in this, or dollars, for the next four weeks. So February 19, we'll ask you to bring them back, and all of the money goes to our local pregnancy resource center called Choices. So, thank you. So this morning, <coughs> as we... Approach the throne. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and acknowledge that you are God. You alone are God, and we are not. Father, you made the heavens and the earth, and you are the creator of all life. You breathed life into man, and he became a living soul. And as we just heard, every life is important. Every life is valuable because you have added value to them. You know all of our names. You know the very hairs of our head. You knew us before we were even conceived. You know all of our days. You know our thoughts before we even think them and our words before we even say them. You know our motives, and you know the end of our days. Father, you are omniscient, all-wise, and all-knowing. Nothing is hidden from you. And Father, we are just in awe of you that you could just speak the word and the world was made. Speak the word and the stars were put in the sky. This is really beyond our comprehension. But that's what makes you God. So Father, we come before you today as a congregation to worship you. For you alone are worthy. You have made us. 
and we are yours. But we're just the sheep of your pasture. You're the potter, and we are the clay in your hands. But you are good, and you are love, and we can trust you. So, Father, even when we sin, you knew it before we did. And you are ready to forgive, not because of any merit of our own, but because of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who chose to come here and become one of us and lived a perfect life doing your will every day of his life. And then he voluntarily was nailed to the cross, not because of anything he had done, but because of our sin. He bore the burden of all of our sin from the beginning of mankind until the end. He paid the price for all of our sin, past, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you for his obedience. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his precious blood that was shed to wash our sins away. Thank you for his death and his burial and his resurrection. Thank you that he is in heaven right now at your right hand, interceding for us and someday is returning to take us home to be with him. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he alone is God. And he will reign forever. And that gives us hope no matter what we're going through. So, Father, I just want to Thank you and praise you and worship you for you alone are holy. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that does his powerful work in us to draw us to yourself, to convict us of our sin, and to empower us to be that light that shines to the world around us. Father, I lift up Donna Bice and Randy and Susie Ashburn and Doug. We pray for healing for these precious women. We pray for patience and unconditional love for these husbands. And Lord, I pray especially for Paul and Kathy Batiste as they are now in Washington for the rest of Paul's days, which could be short. I just pray that your spirit would comfort them both, would give them peace, Help them to rest in you. May we be faithful in praying for these precious brothers and sisters. So, Lord, you have called us to be your children. You have called us to be your ambassadors. I pray that we would bless you today. 
that we would reflect your glory because it really is all about you. So, Father, we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Sherry. You lead us very well in prayer as you lead us in our worship. We have two Old Testament lessons for today. The first from Genesis, again, repeating chapter 1, verses 26 and following. And then from Psalm 139. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Moving to Psalm 139, which begins with this verse, O Lord, you have searched me and known me, and moves to verse 13. For you have formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are all your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Here ends our reading from God's word. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. area there we are how's that better okay y you'd think I'd get my act together after my mirror incident last week but forget about it you know just not happening hey you know the Joash fund is going real well we've raised uh, uh, 8,000 9,000 somewhere in that vicinity towards our matching gift of 25,000 that's to help in case you didn't know it to with um, our sound system, which is actually a disaster, and if you watched online last week, you know why. Everybody got to hear everything I was saying, and it wasn't from the pulpit. <laughs> Good thing I didn't go to the restroom. Also, we're, we're trying to raise funds for our, our roof, which is having a few problems, but um, these are all things that we've got. To, this comes with the territory after 20 years of, of use, and we're not trying to get you to contribute to my jacuzzi fund as a pastor or anything like that or my, you know, pink Cadillac or whatever it is that people like to show off with these days. I guess it's Mary Kay. Never mind about the pink Cadillac. <laughs> uh, last week, we, we uh, looked at the question of what it means to be image bearers of God. And part of what we discovered is that we were made in the image of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as such, we were made for relationships, a relationship with God and a relationship with each other. And because of that, all human life is sacred. Why? Because all human life, no matter how good or how bad, bears his image. Thus, inherently, all human beings have value, all. Jeremiah 1.5 speaks to us saying, 
before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. What's that saying? Before Jeremiah was even in the womb, God knew him. Bud read from Psalm 139, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's you. I'm, I'm looking at you. I can barely see you through the lights, but I'm looking at you. You're made in God's image. You see how the scriptures speak about life? There is a rhyme and reason for why we're here. We're made in God's image. God knew us before we were in our mother's womb. He knit us together in our mother's womb. Do you see why to be Christian is to be pro-life? It's not a political thing per se. It's a spiritual thing. It's how we understand life. Let me be clear here. Satan is the enemy of life. Satan is pro-death. Satan is a depopulationist. We've got him in our culture big time these days. He hates life. He doesn't want people to be fruitful and to multiply. The Bible describes him as masquerading as an angel of light, a murderer, a the father of lies, the prince of darkness. Life is the enemy of of Satan. God is all about life. He's the giver of life, the redeemer of life, the sustainer of life. To know him as Lord is, and as Savior is to know life and that abundantly. So when God creates humankind in his image, it's a sacred setting of the world stage designed to reflect his glory. It, it, we were made to shine your mother or father ever tell you that you were made to shine Shirley you were made to shine Bobby were made to shine Jimmy were made to shine Penny you were made to shine you were made to shine I find that amazing it reminds me of when I was in high school and I got to operate the the lighting for stages I mean it was a disastrous performance because of my lighting abilities but before every performance or rehearsal, you would hear the director say, lights, please, Mansley, lights, please. <laughs> and, and finally, I'd turn them on. Why did, why did the director want lights? So that people could see the brilliance of the actors on the stage. But to what end? Why, why are we here? For what did God make us to shine? You see, against the great backdrop of the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, I want, to, I, I want us to look at how the Bible has literally transformed the human race's understanding of itself. Why does community, our relationships, the church of all things, why, is that, why does that matter to God so much? You see, we're actually going to start a little before Genesis was written. Everything that was ever written written, you know that Moses is accredited with writing the first five books of the Bible, including Genesis. Well, people had been around on earth for a while at that point, but everything that has ever been written has a context. It's important that you come to the Bible and understand that this book has a context too. It was not written in a vacuum. Nothing's written in a vacuum. When the account was written, Israel was surrounded by cultures all, that were made up of all these descendants of Adam and Noah. There were Sumerians and, and uh, Assyrians and Babylonians, and there, there were Canaanites that surrounded Israel, and there were the Egyptians. They all had created new religions because they'd all rebelled against God. They all had certain gods, which means that they were all polytheistic, and they all had in common a hierarchical view of life. And under these cultures, gods would be the kings, the king. And then under the king, there was the court. And at that level, there would be also be priests who reported to who? The king. And underneath the court and priests would be artisans and merchants and craftspeople, and then under them were this 
was this enormous mass of peasants and slaves who were considered to be the dregs of society. In ancient Mesopotamian culture, the king was treated how? As a divine or semi-divine uh, character. He was understood to be made in the image of the God who created him. The, the Hebrew word for the image, or for image rather, was Salem. Say that with me. Salem. There's a T-S at the front of it. Salem. The, the, the king was thought to be made in the Salem of the God. And this was the dividing line between the king and the rest of the human race. Peasants and slaves, they weren't made in the image of anybody. Uh, the, the king was the mediator to the people through whom the blessings of the gods flowed to everybody else. Salem is also the word for idols or idol images. All these religions had them. They were all controlled by priests who were under the control of the king. So everybody else only had access to heaven through the king. Now listen, this is huge. This is huge. I hope you're sticking with me here. Genesis challenges all of this stuff. Genesis has a very different account of creation. In Genesis, it's the spirit of the one God who orders creation. And over the seven days of creation, uh, in, in creation, God makes seven speeches. And the final speech, he ordains that the Sabbath is a holy day. And the writer of Genesis deliberately uses language that would be used for a king. God was, was placed in a royal role in Genesis. God says, let there be light, and there was light. Now that's what the way kings uh, do things, right? They proclaim it, and bam, it happens. Let there be taxes, and there they are. You know, God is portrayed as the sovereign, not earthly king. And then we're told by the seventh day that God finished what he'd been doing. And we're going to come back to that here in a minute. Now, Genesis doesn't just say that God is sovereign. It also says that God is generous and he's wise and that he delights in his creation. God saw all that he made and it was? No, no, no. It was very good. It was very very good. This idea of being very good implies that creation is filled with the glory, the character, the goodness, the generosity of the God who made it. God created a special place here on earth for human beings. It's called the Garden of Eden. And then, then we're, we were, were told that these this garden, and we're told all these little, little odd facts about the garden, and some of us have never really thought about these before. But in Genesis 2, which is set in the Garden of Eden, we're told that there was gold of, in that land, and it's, it's good. Uh, it, there is Aramaic, uh, aromatic rather resin, and onyx was also there. Why do they tell us this? Why does the writer tell us about gold and onyx and, and uh, resin? Well, these are all materials, friends, that were to be used in the future temple. Uh, God told, uh, gold made it a beautiful place. The stones made it a beautiful place. Resin made it smell great. All of this was to indicate the presence of God in the Garden of Eden. We're also told that Adam heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's as if the earth is God's temple. Wow. But the Garden of Eden is the holiest place there. Adam and Eve, who are they? They're priests in the garden with God. And when it comes to human beings, things get really very, very interesting. God says in verse 26, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and so on and so forth. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, what? Male and female. He created them. 
Now that word for image in Hebrew is the same word that we talked about earlier. What is it? Ooh, somebody was listening out there. Salem, Salem. In the image of God, God created all human beings. Th this statement by the writer of Genesis is the single most world-changing statement about human dignity, worth, and equality that's ever been recorded in the history of the earth. Are you with me? Whether you think yourself to be a believer or not, we're all banking on the truth and, and, and change that this book has made in the human race's understanding of itself. We are. Imagine what it did to the hearts of the peasants and slaves who were told uh, that, that not just the, the, the king, but they too were created in the Salem, the image of the one great God. Male and female, slaves and peasants, all were made in the image of God. What if th there, there was a community where everyone, everybody treated everybody else as if they were a king? Could you imagine that? Wow. Nobody on top, nobody on the bottom. What if, what, what if there was a community where a billionaire looked at somebody who was homeless and treated that person with honor and respect because that's how they saw that person? They're not just being nice. What if somebody really, really powerful, somebody who ran a big organization, saw somebody who was, who was jobless and treated that person like she was a queen? <laughs> Low self-esteem is so painful because we were made in the image of God. The Latin phrase for image, image of God is imago Dei. In Hebrew, it was Salem Elohim. That's why when your worth, dignity, and sense of value is damaged, it's brutal. That's why the mistreatment of other human beings is so very serious to God. Look at what it says in, in Genesis 9. And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Why? Because in the image of God, God made mankind. You've never, you have never looked at another human being, no matter how ragged they may appear to you, who wasn't made in the image of God. Look at somebody near you and say, you're made in the image of God. Point at them. You're made in the image of God. You are, Virginia. Praise the Lord. Here's another Genesis distinctive. In every other religion in the ancient world, the idea of one divine king uh, made in the image of God is traced back to a creation myth. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that the, the Bible's account of the, the creation is a myth. I'm talking about other religions. Understand me? Okay. They believed that the king was part of God's plan to reign over the earth. The king was the son of God, small g, and the way God's ruled. Israel had a very different story. Israel doesn't have a king for centuries of its existence. I mean, really, for, for centuries after the creation, there was no king. And only when they go and they beg the prophet Samuel uh, to have a king, does anything change? When Samuel's this old guy, older than any of us, you know, the, the Israelites go to Samuel and say, you're old. Appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. I mean, Samuel tries to talk him out of it. He knows that this isn't God's plan for his people. You know, but the people refuse to listen. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations. Oh, doesn't that sound like a second grader? We want a king. All the other kids have a king. This is exactly how they sounded. How come we can't have a king? It isn't fair. So, so God says to Samuel, okay, give him a king, Samuel. This isn't about you. That They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. 
I had another plan for the human race, and it wasn't this plan, but, but, but they wouldn't want it. They're not ready for it. They probably will never be ready for it. Nobody else has a story like Israel's, where the king doesn't even come until centuries after the creation, and then as a concession against the will of God. How different than those cultures whose king was the one who alone bore the image of a god. The Bible brings to the world a revolutionary understanding of the human project, friends. The fact that you are made in the image of God tells you not just about your worth and your value, though it does, but also about your destiny. There's a very clear historical context behind this notion of being made in the image of God. You see, in ancient times, there was no media, there was no internet, no papers, no Snapchat or, you know, whatever else, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. So this is what kings would do. They'd set up images of themselves, statues in the farthest flung corners of their empire so that everyone would know who was the ruler. Well, it was a little like politicians of our days, you know, putting their name on post offices or uh, schools or highways or whatever. They want people to know who's in charge. Well, the writer of Genesis is saying that just as the king would place images of himself around an empire so that everybody know who, would know who he is, who the ruler is, so God places his own image. And what is his image? It's human beings. He places his own image into the world so that the world can see who the ruler is. Amen? This is what it means to be made in the image of God. It's not about having this or that quality. It's not about whether you have reason or free will. It's about your role in the cosmic scheme of things. You're made to reign under God's character with God's power in God's stead for the benefit of the earth so that all of the earth can know who reigns in it. You are made in the image of God, friends. God, God's plans to graciously... He, plans to graciously share his power by creating a community of loving people who will exercise dominion through his strength marked by his goodness. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are, are you getting any of this? Or have I lost you all? Some of you have your eyes going around in your head like this. There's this tiny picture in the, of the Garden of Eden where we're told that God brings animals to man to see what the man will name them. Oh, how cute. God doesn't, you know, God could have done that. He could have named all the animals. But whatever the man calls each living creature, what does he do? That becomes its name. See, this is a little bit of a re reflection of the Salem Elohim that is in you and in me and was in Adam. How many of you have ever had a pet? When you call your pet, you say, hey, you, non-human companion. <laughs> no. Well, our love of animals and our ability to have insight into their natures and even tame them or train them is all a part of this divine salem. That's why there is something in us that responds to the creatures God made. We have a little bit of his heart in us. See, the idea of this image of God business is that through us, through our learning, through our culture, through our relationships, through technology, through the arts, through medicine, through all of these things, we reflect who God is. We are, with humility, to add goodness and beauty to families, to neighborhoods, to societies, to nations, to people who are hungry and homeless or have no education so that God's whole project becomes a glorious delight in generosity and, and righteousness to all who see it. And dear friends, I want to come back to what Jim was saying about my friend James Whitford coming here in, in a couple of weeks. 
I expect all y'alls, if you aren't doing anything on a Saturday morning that is really important, be there because James Whitford understands the poor and he understands the church. And I've worked with Mother Teresa before in Calcutta, India. This man is just like her. Looks a little different. The prophet Habakkuk says, the, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the story. There's a narrative. It's, it's not, it isn't an accident. This isn't a random blob of protoplasm floating around in the universe as some scientists would have us believe. This is God's plan. This is your story. This is my story. This is the big story that we're all a part of. It's glorious. And here's what happens. God reigns over the earth through these, these little human creatures made in his, him, his image who bring God's good rule, God's good reign down to earth. And then in turn, that glory, that joy, the, the gratitude, the goodness, the, the heavens then declare the glory of God. It wells up from in us and, and, and we put words to it and turn it into praise and offer it back to God. We're like... <clears throat> Little mirrors. <laughs> After last week's incident, I wasn't allowed to bring a bigger one up here. We're created, friends, to reflect God's rule to the earth and to reflect God's joy up to God. Your destiny is to reflect the holy reign of God on this earth, to care for all of creation and particularly human beings the way that God would want you to care for them. And then you're to gather up all the goodness and delight from the earth, put it into words, and offer it back up to God in, in raucous, joyful worship. Your destiny is to contribute more creative, God-given goodness to the earth than you can currently imagine, and then to offer more earthly joy and gratitude to God than you can con currently con contain. And by the way, if you're a little frustrated that your accomplishments in life were kind of meager, forget about it. You have more before you in God's eternity than you could ever imagine. The Bible says that you're going to be a king. The reign of God, and that lady, by the way, ladies, don't get all worked up about the sexist thing. We're brides too, so just let it go. The, the, the reign of God will flow through you to enhance the earth. And you'll be a priest. The praise and glory of the earth will flow through you to be offered to God. You will be a priest and you will be a king. The Reve in Revelation 22, John says, The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him, and they will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. To reign isn't some static thing where you're stuck on some boring throne. It means that you will be strong and powerful and creative in making what is good and achieving value and beauty and delight and humility and joy. That is the destiny that lies before you in eternity, friends. You're just not going to get to see Grandma Gertie. That's not what we're... No, we're talking about royalty, friends. You're going to be a king and a priest. Hallelujah. So how are we doing with this these days? Is the earth pretty much covered with the glory of the knowledge of God like the waters cover the sea? No, it isn't. Because of the presence of sin, we know that. God's still here because of the... But, but because I'm sinful, okay, God is still here, but because I'm sinful, I, I don't want to be a mirror. I, mean, I don't want to be a mirror. Yeah, you got a pimple there. Yeah, I don't want to be a mirror. I, I, I don't want to reflect God's reign. I want to reign. King me. I want my will to be done, not God's will. And when praise and glory come, I don't want to go, it to go up to God. I want it to come to me because of sin, because of pride, because of selfishness and darkness and deceit that have all robbed me of this mirror and distorted the, average, the image of God in me. I want 
now to be my own little god. I mean, I, I live now in the kingdom of self instead of the kingdom of God. We all do. Sin's messed everything up. And as a result of the fall, we see the effects of sin immediately in what's called the curse. And I'm not referring to D.C. No, I'm not. Our work, our dominion is messed up. Our work are, 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 are just embedded with nettles and thistles and thorns. And we labor by the sweat of our brow. Dominion is messed up. Relationships are messed up. As a result of the fall, God says to the woman, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Right, honey? <laughs> Don't think this is a biblical mandate, friends. Don't think that this was a part of God's original plan for the human race. A husband ruling over his wife wasn't part of God's original plan before the fall. It was part of the curse from which Jesus died to redeem us. What happened in Genesis is this. Instead of there being community, instead of there being harmony, instead of there being love and joy between genders, there's hostility and darkness, and we see it deepening day by day by day. And there's a struggle for power. We, we attempt to reign and inflict our own wills on each other. Does anyone here ever mismanage conflict? Hmm? Anybody here nurse resentment? Hmm? Do you ever not go, go directly to somebody when you have a problem with her? Do you ever send a sarcastic email to someone or make a cutting re remark about somebody behind their back? See, we've become people who destroy community who damage other people and ourselves, and this is very serious. This behavior violates the image of God. In a sense, it blasphemes the God in whose image we were all made. Instead of rolling back the darkness, we invite it in and wallow in it. Adam and Eve leave the garden. God places on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim to guard it. But God doesn't give up on us. He begins again. This is our God. This is who our God is. On Mount Sinai, he, he makes a covenant with Israel. He gives them the Ten Commandments. I look at what he says first. He says, although the whole earth is mine, I see God cares for it all. And that reality often gets lost on us. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The language used here is no accident. You will be priests. You're going to bring worship to God. And you will be kings. You're going to bring God's dominion to the earth. Then God makes his covenant. God gives Israel the law. And then he does a very, very strange thing. He tells Moses, build a tabernacle, a holy place that expresses my presence on earth. The, the, the last 15 chapters of Israel is just very detailed instructions that will put you right to sleep as you're going through the Bible in a year. It's kind of tedious, but there's one detail that's very interesting. Take a guess at how big the tabernacle was. The tabernacle was smaller than our church building. <gasps> what? Yeah, the tabernacle was 45 feet by 45 feet. Our sanctuary, I believe, is 55 feet by 55 feet, and it's way taller than the 15 feet of the tabernacle. See, that's how big the tabernacle was. The tabernacle wasn't valuable because of its size. The value isn't in the structure. There's a greater reason why Israel loves the tabernacle. The construction of the tabernacle takes seven days. During the creation of the tabernacle, God makes seven speeches to Moses to instruct him in how to make it. And the seventh speech is set aside uh, to consecrate the Sabbath. The Spirit of God, who in Genesis 1 hovers over the waters of the deep, is said to have, been, have, is said to have filled uh, Basil, Bas, Basilel, I, I am having trouble with my pronunciation, Basilel, the craftsman, 
to inspire the creation of the tabernacle. First, that's the first time in the Bible that anybody is said to be filled with the Spirit of God. The entrance to the tabernacle, God says, is to face the east. The Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, the holiest place, is to be guarded by the cherubim. Does this sound familiar to you? The Holy of Holies is decorated with what? Gold. Ha! It's sweetened with incense. On the breastplate of Aaron, the high priest, the holy one, the, the only guy who could go into the Holy of Holies, there's a stone on, on which are written the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel representing all the people of God. That stone is made of onyx. In Genesis 2, the, the creation's done, and the text says, and so God finished the work. In Exodus, when the tabernacle's done, and so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord fills it so intensely, we're told that Moses can't even enter it. The glory fills it like the waters cover the sea. Why does Israel love the tabernacle? The tabernacle isn't designed to be some little point of refuge so that people can escape the world and be safe. The tabernacle is designed to be a miniature cosmos. It's all of creation in miniature. It's a picture, a symbol of Israel every time we see it, an expression of what God intends to happen to the whole of his creation, yet he will dwell with his people. His creation will get to see his glory. Oh no, we're going to lose the planet. Send trillions of dollars to the wealthy people in Davos. And then we have Jesus who comes along. John says the, the word became flesh and dwelt. The word translated dwelt is the Greek word for tent or tabernacle. This is the very, this is the, John was being very deliberate on, on this. You can literally translate this. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we've seen his what? Glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the Messiah. But people still think of Messiah in human terms. In fact, after Jesus miraculously feeds the 5,000, it occurs to people that, whoa, man, baby, if this guy can, can, can do this, if he can feed 5,000 people out of nothing, he can give out of a few loaves and fish, whatever. Get this guy a sword. Imagine what he can do with a chariot and a horse. Holy mackerel, he's our secret weapon. So they tried to make him king by force. But Jesus, knowing this, withdraws by himself to the hills. He spends a few short years uh, teaching and manifesting a kingdom, a, a kingship, a rule of another kind, a servanthood and humility, a, a generosity and a self-sacrificing love. In Jesus, God is beginning the Genesis project all over again at infinite cost to him. On the cross where Jesus dies for your sin. You might remember Jesus' final words. It is finished. At the end of creation, God said, it is finished. At the end of the tabernacle, Moses said, it is finished. And now finally, all of the damage, sins done has been defeated, and it is finished. And when he says those words, the curtain that's a what, a foot and a half thick in the, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, is ripped in two from top to bottom. And now anyone can walk right in to a relationship with God. What's this new creation look, look like? Where does God dw now dwell? Peter says it like this, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice uh, and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, dear friends. Do you understand this? You are a people belonging to God. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul exhorts us, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? 
Did you hear that? His spirit now dwells in you. You are now the temple. And what does the Holy Spirit produce in us? Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Forget about the woke culture. Don't try to be like them. Be like this. So when Genesis says we're made in the image of God and Jesus says you are the light of the world, it means that we are to reflect these qualities in our relationships. When Jesus tells us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, and when Paul tells us that we are ambassadors for Christ, that means that we light up the world every time we confess, serve, declare, honor, proclaim, and witness to the gospel. Every time we pray, forgive, restore, reconcile, every time we take a stand for righteousness, we are spreading the glory of God far and wide as his new creations. Now the glory of God is somehow seen on on this earth, not as a tent or a building, but in the unity and harmony and love of a community of redeemed men and women who live in oneness through the Spirit, purchased at the cross of Jesus Christ and known as the church. You, dear friends, are priests and kings and stewards of God's dream community. (laughs) The reign of God. Come down. And the glory of God rise up. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that in our wretched estate, you did not abandon us on this mortal coil. But, oh, Lord, you rescued us, you redeemed us, and you made us new. Praise be to God. Amen. Let's stand together. And close our worship singing, My Life is in You, Lord.